Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Wow, what a great crowd tonight. How are Thank you doing, you. Mr. Bill? Real, or should I say Mr. Pink? Mr. Pink Jacket. I am excited, my friend, for tonight's episode. I think this is going to be so entertaining for people. Um, uh, I'll just start off with a uh, a little, let's see here if I got it. Maybe I don't. Oh, you got it, baby. Um, no, no, no. I, I was looking for a certain quote, but I don't have it on my soundboard. So... But uh, you know we're as transparent as we know how to be, so we'll see. We'll see if that holds up true tonight, my friend. Yeah, I mean, you came up with the subject for tonight's episode. What is it, Bill? Gaslighting. 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 You know, I watched that movie last night, or at least I watched the first half, and then I had to go to bed. But yeah, it, it, did you think? Of, I, I didn't think it was that great of a movie, but my wife and I enjoyed watching it because there were times early in our marriage where I would gaslight her, and as we watched it, we would talk about like. Yeah, I, I was kind of a, you know, a piece of crap. So, yeah. And and when you understand how this process works, and we'll explain it here in a moment. I got a hair on my face. We'll explain it here in a moment. But gaslighting really does mess up people's psychological healthiness. It it really messes uh, messes up their, their you know, reality. Um, but thought we would start off easily just to find gaslighting. I used a couple of things to put together. It says, when a person or group presents a false narrative to another group or person, which leads them to doubt their perceptions and become misled, disoriented, and or distressed, generally for the gaslighter's own benefit. And I thought we'd start off tonight by playing a little clip of that movie that you were just watching yesterday. And so I'm going to see if Maven can put that up on the screen. Well, great. And uh, we'll go from there. Give me just uh, give her just a second. Okay. And then I'll, I'm and then sorry. I'll... Which one is it? I don't know. Oh, it's the black and white movie from YouTube, Gaslight. Um, 1944. Yeah, where did I put that? Okay. Sorry. One second. Yeah. Sorry. It's at the very top of the outline. Yeah. I thought I put that already, like had it ready for the stream, but I did not. Sorry. No sweat. Pulling it up right now. Here we go. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to take myself off. <laughs> You know, this must be the 1942 version. That's why you didn't like it so well. What is it? I've just noticed something. If you put it right when I'm not looking, I will see no more about it. What's the matter? I don't understand. Paul, don't turn your back on me. Look on the wall behind you. Picture, it's gone again. Yes. Where have you hidden it this time? I didn't take it. Why should I take it? It's no use to me. Why should you take other things? Pencils, knives. Paul, don't. Bella, where's the picture? And uh, that'll be good enough. The, the movies, the whole idea of the movie is that it's the husband who's continually hiding things. His wife comes from a wealthy family and they, he wants to take in their inheritance. Plus he keeps sneaking into an apartment upstairs where a wealthy woman was living and he's trying to get where her secret treasure is hidden away as well. And he doesn't want to get caught. So he makes his wife look like she's crazy and she's believing it. So she thinks she's ill when she, really she's the normal, rational, healthy human being. And so he took the painting, hid it upstairs at the top of the steps, but that's where he's placed it before and convinced her that she's the one who hit it. 
And so continually disrupting uh, her reality. And so that's where the word gaslighting comes from. It comes from the movie Gaslight. Uh, and that, I believe, is the original version. And I don't know if it was based on a book or not. I think it was based on a stage play. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but that's the 1942 version. It's the 1940. I think it is. It's the 1944 version. That's the the famous one. Oh, I mean, well, that's I watched Ingrid, that one. Yeah, where Ingrid Bergman, the lady who's getting gaslit, and her husband's making her think that she's always stealing things, but she can't remember it. Yeah, you know that could have been cast for Winona Ryder, but it was I a figured bit the horror time. I figured the older, the further back I went, the less okay. chance YouTube would uh, flag us for a copyright violation. Oh, I see. Well, Ingrid Bergman <laughs> won Academy Award for Best Actress. Mm, I'll have to watch that version. Yeah, the, the amazing thing is that when she took the award at the Academy Awards, Will Smith came up on stage and slapped her in the <laughs> face. Somebody was asking if we were going to touch on that topic today. No, everyone and, was uh, shocked. They couldn't believe that he would slap Ingrid, Ingrid Bergman in the face. Yeah, we had a we had an interesting text thread where we all kind of I was asking you guys in the text thread what you guys thought about it. And I, I think I'm the only one who could, it, I, I'm not, I'm not approving of the violence, but I can, I can understand the emotion and the trauma that goes into why someone would do that. And I think that when somebody mocks a person on a very personal level, you are opening yourself up to something again, not, not justifying violence. I think there were a thousand things Will Smith could have done, but, uh, was a crazy moment, wasn't it? Absolutely crazy. And the thing I like best is watching the audience reactions to it. Yeah. By yeah. the way, I just wanted to mention here, number one, uh, we talked about the, the gaslighting movie. Yes, that's where this phrase gaslighting comes from. And frankly, gaslighting is a much misused term because it lying is not gaslighting. No. All right. Gaslighting is lying, but it's a very narrow and specific kind of lying. And it's where you are trying to get another person to doubt their recollection of something they experienced by pretending that it was something else. And frequently, you know, you're in the same house or in the same room with them. So it's easy for you to say, no, that's not how I remembered it. That's not what happened. What are you talking about? You must be losing your mind. You know, that kind of thing, which drives her nuts. And of course, the gaslighting thing is uh, because this is late 19th century. It's London. There, the power, the lighting is gas mm -hmm. that comes in and the gas lights are on downstairs. Just think of a chandelier or a sconce, a wall sconce or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, the bad guy who's played much better, I'm sure, by Charles Boyer in the movie. By the way, Angela Lansbury's in the, the movie, too. There's a rather mm -hmm. saucy, saucy wench who's there made. Long before Murder, She Wrote. Yes, yes. And Joseph Cotton, he's the hero. Anyway, that's why it's a big deal. 44 version. I recommend that highly. Okay. But but the whole deal about it is, is that um, we talked about that. What that's what gaslighting is. And the gaslights, Charles Boyer is upstairs and he's hunting around in the attic trying to find uh, the jewels of the woman who happened to be Ingrid Bergman's aunt that he had murdered and strangled sometime before. Uh, he can't find the jewels. He ends up going into hiding. He gets married to Ingrid Bergman. You can guess who approaches who in that scenario. It's Charles Boyer approaching her, gets her to move back in the house so he can be upstairs trying to find these freaking jewels, which he didn't get the first time. And she's downstairs and the gas lights go down downstairs. Because well, the someone reason else they go is down, using it. Because someone using it upstairs, right? Exactly. So because he's turning the gas lights up upstairs. So it's causing the gas lights to go down downstairs. Yeah. And Ingrid Bergman is saying, well, what happened to the gas lights? I mean, why why did they go down? And he's saying, well, they didn't go down. What are you talking about? Even even the maid and the other people in the home who are helping in the 1942 version are um, also seconding the guy's perspective and trying to tell her that she's crazy. So she not only hears him telling her, she's got all the help around the house telling her. And and so you begin to doubt your own reality and you it makes you think, like, I don't think I'm crazy. Um, I had a little story here. Let's say that you grew up in a home where none the of us is... do build, by the way. Say that again. None of us think we're crazy. None of us, especially the crazy people. Yeah. Um, let's say you grew up in a home where the kitchen is painted blue. You go away from for college, you come back home and you discover the walls are orange. When you say to your family, I love the way the kitchen looks with the new orange walls, they look at you and say, What do you mean? The walls have always been orange. In such a moment, you're forced to decide not only whether you can trust your memory but also what you've perceived was a shared reality. Do you doubt yourself? Do you doubt your family? What happens when lots of your relatives don't seem to remember the blue walls you grew up with? What happens when everyone you know seems to indicate that the problem must be you? And uh, you can imagine 
Uh, and I've got a document later that I'll share that was uh, somebody helped me put together that's got multiple examples of gaslighting. But we're going to go through a few tonight. But, you know, think about what would happen if you are absolutely certain that your life experience was a certain way. You, you know your memory is at least relatively accurate. Yes. And everyone around you is telling you it's not. And right. Mormonism does this all the time. And one time, okay, my memory, I'm not perfect. That's weird. I thought I remembered it. Maybe I'm wrong. But then you and get multiplied and then you start doubting yourself <clears throat> and i think that you start put you put your trust in the person who's telling you the information that's different from what you remember so you put your your source of authority as you would put it bill outside of you and into somebody else to trust as to what the reality was regardless of what it is that you experience and i think we do that a lot in the church i think it's encouraged in the church to put trust in the leaders uh if you'll give me just like 60 seconds i'll tell you a personal story about gaslighting Except, unfortunately, I was not playing Ingrid Bergman. I was playing the part of Charles Boyer. This, <laughs> this, I've never told this story that I can recall, certainly not publicly. But this is the story that's also titled How RFM Almost Got Kicked Out of the MTC. <laughs> See, I knew that would bring a chuckle to you. I hope it did some other people too. But the deal is this. I've been there for, uh, I'm going to be there for two months because I'm learning Japanese. So it's a two month stint at the MTC. I've been there for the first month. At least month it wasn't now. reformed Egyptian. That would really be difficult. That would be very difficult. That'd be harder than Japanese, I think. But so we're, we're there. And uh, of course, I didn't get called to go preach to the reformed Egyptians either. So we're there and we get these new two missionaries. There's four missionaries per room, right? Four missionaries to go out and two new ones come in. And now my companion and I were the old ones in the room. Anyway, I apologize. I'm coughing. I've got this uh, nasty thing going. But regardless, um, the new companionship was Elder Nebaker and Elder Western. Elder Western. Oh, yeah. And Elder Nebaker and Elder Western did not get along. Elder Nebaker and I got along. But Elder Western was kind of full of himself. At least that's how we saw it. He very much was always riding his high horse, probably on a Western saddle on that high horse. And we decided one night we were going to teach him a lesson. And this is obviously past bedtime at 1030. I'm sorry, I said 60 seconds. I've already exceeded that. Anyway, I cannot remember exactly what we did, but I mean, it wasn't physical. It was all mental. And Elder Nebuchadnezzar and I got together and we decided we were going to play mind games on Elder Western. And having him see things that we were doing that we would later say, what are you talking about? We didn't do this. It was just classic. I hadn't seen the movie and I'm falling into this. Well, the reason I bring this up is we're only doing this a couple hours. Elder Western had a mental breakdown. Ooh. He had, uh, he, I don't think he went to the third floor of uh, the Salt Lake City Hospital, but he did. The leaders won't having, visit you there. Just so you know. Yeah. And the problem was, is that he kept resisting it. He kept resisting it. I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing, which only go to us to continue doing it and up the ante. Right. And so when he broke, he finally broke hard. And uh, yeah, I got to the district leader of our mission group, who's an old guy. And me and Elder Debaker, we got called in front of him separately. And we thought, oh, my gosh, this is it for us. We're going to get sent home. And we didn't get sent home, which in retrospect may not have been the best thing that ever happened to me, mm. not getting sent home from the MTC. But mm. I was terrified about how the folks back home, not my folks, but the other Mormons back home, would view me that I got kicked out of the MTC. So all I'm saying this is, is that I have been on the giving end of gaslighting, and it's it can be powerful, and it can yeah. cause real trauma to the person. It was much more than I ever expected it would it would that would happen and this was just over the course of a couple hours one night well let's see what trauma we've all endured are you ready okay <laughs> it, I, I appreciate that by the way to be vulnerable and say look i did some damage i i was on this side of it and uh, it really hurt somebody uh at least gives us a taste of why this is so wrong to do in the first place and unfortunately mormonism there, there are literally about 200 examples i came across in preparation for this episode, I picked out five that I thought would be entertaining and informational. And uh, you've got a couple others that we're hoping to add in uh, somewhere along the way as well. So let's do the first one. The first one's a really soft one. Uh, 
Maven, do you have the the thing where they're stating the uh, idea that they're not going to ask probing or invasive questions? Yep. So this is, let me change our background here. Um, this is uh, the church saying this. This is, in these interviews, church leaders are instructed to be sensitive to the character, circumstances, and understanding of the young man or young woman. They are counseled not to not be unnecessarily probing or invasive in their questions, but should allow a young person to share their experiences, struggles, and feelings. Now, they say that in one place, but in another place, they have uh, the instructions regarding missionaries. And if you remember, we have an age change, and we now send 18-year-olds out on a mission, so we're one year younger. And these are these could very potentially be 17-year-olds who are being interviewed um, to get ready for their mission to go when they're 18 years old. So we still are talking, at least in some situations, about possibly underage uh, folks or children. And so notice here in the changes to the missionary application, number five, worthiness interviews need to be ex need to be specific and explicit. Not just do you live the law of chastity. In other words, you should ask more probing questions than do you live the law of chastity. The For Strength of Youth pamphlet is very helpful in interviews of this kind. So the church wants to say like, no, 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 you guys shouldn't be asking probing questions. And meanwhile, the church still instructs its leaders to ask probing questions. Good point. The question that I like the most is, do you use your left hand or your right hand when you masturbate? Yeah, see, that's the thing too. You leave it up to the local leader. So if they go too far, you can blame it on them. But by but the reality is you have encouraged the leaders to go off the script. Well, these kids aren't going to just confess on their own. You've got to no. give them the third degree, Bill. Right. So that's that one to me is a really it's a serious one, but it's a light one. I think I think the church could make an argument and go, you know, these are missionaries, these are adults that go, we're talking about the youth, so they might want to distinguish. I don't see that, but they might want to do it. So we'll get to some more serious ones. Bill, can uh, I just second, say something for a second? Please. This is on your in your defense, just in case there's anybody who misinterpreted what you just said about this is one of the lighter ones. You're not talking about the issue itself as being light. I know no. that you know that. I just want to make that clear for anybody who's listening who might think otherwise. You're talking about the degree of gaslighting that's going on with these opposing statements. I'm talking about also their rebuttal. They might be able to persuade us with an argument that rebuts what the point we're making by saying in one instance, we're talking about adults. And in the other instance, we're talking about kids. Got it. So it may not be as clear cut if you were to sit down with the church and with a handful of believers and put this problem, this issue of this example of gaslighting in front of them, they might have an excuse that would be that would hold some weight with at least some people. Right. You know, what's interesting where number five says worthiness interviews need to be specific and explicit. It's under changes to missionary application. But then in the sources, it says the for the strength of youth pamphlet is very helpful in interviews of this kind. And that's obviously directed at not adults, but the youth, the children. Yeah. Yeah. Notice that. Hmm. Um, example number two. Thank you for pointing that out, by the way. Elder Ballard recently, this is maybe a year or two ago. Elder Ballard said he doesn't know where the missionaries got the idea that people should be invited to be baptized after the first discussion. Maven, will you put that up on the screen? Look at this. So. This is uh, the church news, and this is Elder Ballard's uh, presentation that he gave where uh, he discussed at length that we shouldn't be asking, we shouldn't feel pressure to ask missionaries after the first discussion to get baptized, and he doesn't know where this began. He doesn't know where this came from. It's not just bad enough in the first sentence there. Church leaders don't know where this practice began. Notice up higher in the other paragraph just above in the very beginning, some missionaries have felt pressure to invite people to be baptized during the first lesson or even first contact. Where did that come from? Yeah, where does that come from? Why do so um, many missionaries have the same pressure? I don't understand, Bill. Perhaps you can tell yeah. us. Yeah, and then at the end there, as you're pointing out the pressure, our retention rates will dramatically increase when people desire to be baptized because of spiritual experiences they're having, rather than feeling pressured into being baptized by our missionaries. He doesn't know where this came from. He doesn't He doesn't know. The, the truth is, he's been in the church a long time. It actually oh, came yeah. from him. Ah. This, is, this is the Preach My Gospel, which, by the way, I've got my own little copy here. Came out Still in 2005. In yeah. The Preach My Gospel. Will you put that back up for a second, Maven? 
Is there a way to enlarge that? Is this a page from Preach My Gospel? Uh, notice this one here. Check your progress. I invite my investigators to be baptized in the first lesson. Never up at the top, the key. Never, sometimes, often, almost always, always. And then if you go back to the other page that was harder to see. Um, did you want to go? Because you wanted to preach my gospel first, right? I, know uh, I think both top. of these are either from that or from instructions around it. Okay. Yeah. No, I can go back to the other one. And then I have the actual preach my gospel page. I think oh, gotcha. you want that cool. too. So um, you really can't see it there, but there's that top one that we just talked about. The I invite my investigators to be baptized in the first lesson. Down in the middle there, it says, uh, I, yep, I invite my investigators to be baptized in the first lesson. So we have it again. And then there's one more, right? Look at that. Emphasize the importance of the last bullet, which introduces the covenant of baptism and prepares the investigator to accept the invitation to be baptized at the end of the first lesson. We don't know where in the hell this came from. Where did it come from? Where are these missionaries getting this pressure, Bill? Yeah, you and I, I don't know. Did you, what discussions did you have? Because I had the six discussions in the threefold pamphlets. Mine was different only because I was toward the sunset era of the rainbow discussions. But in Japan, Elder Yoshiko Kikuchi, who was the GA over Japan and other areas in Asia. Elder Kikuchi, yeah, I remember him. Yeah, Kikuchi Choro. He got special permission. He wanted to do a special lesson plan for Japanese people. And he got permission from the first presidency to, to do that. Nice. So we memorized a different kind of missionary discussion authored by um, Elder Kikuchi. When I took the six discussions, the threefold pamphlet, the invitation to baptize was at the end of the second discussion. So what that means is that the pressure to invite someone to be baptized at the end of the first lesson came under the leadership, including Elder Ballard. Yeah, just so absolutely. You know, just so you know where it came from. There's there's the lesson I took, study guide number two. And uh, I think it's all the way towards the end, if I'm not mistaken. This well, was this cool was how second. you're doing that. And I remember how we always used to do this. It's not like I didn't go on a mission and I didn't do this or was expected to do it. That's the pressure. Because it's very much like, oh, man, uh, this is awkward because this person doesn't really know anything about the church. That's so the, the way we would frame it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go so ahead and finish what, The way we would express it was, uh, you know, this is the Book of Mormon. We're going to give it to you. Here's Moroni's promise. Pray about it. And if you were to have your prayers answered by the Holy Ghost, would you be baptized? Yeah. yeah. That's how we would always put it. That, uh, it's kind of a uh, a chicken way of doing it, but at least we're out there swinging. But the crazy thing is, I think there was some kind of kerfuffle that happened where this uh, first lesson into first lesson invitation to be baptized came up publicly. Elder Ballard was obviously embarrassed. And so he decided instead of taking responsibility for it, since he's the one who authored or authorized at a minimum the... Right. Preach my gospel manual. I mean, everybody in the top 15 had to authorize that. You yeah. talk about a manual that's going to get the most strict scrutiny of any. It's going to be the missionary discussions, right? Yeah. It's got to have that seal of approval. But instead of simply saying, yeah, that was in there, and uh, sometimes it's a good idea, but it's always if the spirit, right? If yeah. the spirit prompts you. Yeah. Of course, if the spirit doesn't prompt you, you're not being a good missionary, but we don't have to go there. But instead of acknowledging it, accepting it, owning it, he wants to blame the missionaries for it in order to get the blood off of his skirts because he doesn't want to say that, yeah, we put it in there. It's right there. Everybody who's been on a mission knows this. And it's easily documentable when I'm going to say, when I'm going to gaslight and say, uh, I have no idea where this guy idea came from. Those crazy yeah. missionaries, they're doing crazy things all the time. I, I want to read this, Maven, but will you go back to that pamphlet one more time, go to that last page? I just want to show people that it wasn't in the previous yeah, so look at the very bottom right. This is the lesson number two, by the way. This is the second discussion when I joined the church. Okay. It says, uh, number three, pray earnestly to know whether you should be baptized and become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's not the missionary inviting them. The missionaries would hand me the pamphlet at the end of the second discussion and ask me to read it. And it's the church and its leadership in their correlated discussion pamphlet asking me to consider being baptized after the second discussion. 
So again, I'm just simply saying that for it to move to the first discussion, it happened while Elder Ballard has been a leader in the church. Good point. Yeah. Go and back I think to that, that, other... that is yeah. a classic example of gaslighting. It used in its proper, proper sense because what he's doing is he's trying to get people to believe that what they experienced isn't what they really experienced. Correct. You're messing with my reality. I'm like, wait a minute. I remember missionaries asking me, and then I go into the come follow me, and I, the, the yeah, preach my gospel. I'm sorry. Preach my gospel, and the missionaries are instructed in there to ask at the first discussion. I it, have, to me, is insane. Sorry. There's been a few people in the comments saying it was at the end of the first discussion, which I think is what I have up here, but I don't see it. Um, I don't know. Do we have the chat to say where it's I happened? remember at the time missionaries... If you see it, say so, because I'll be corrected. But I remember at the time missionaries telling me that they were told by their leaders, their mission president, that if they felt the spirit, they were to invite even in the first discussion. But I don't think it's formally in there. Elder Ballard and the rest of the 15 added it under their watch. So we do know where it came from. Is this something that you have up here on the screen? Is that from the Preach My Gospel this manual? Maybe the current one. This yeah. is so the it's... current one. Notice in the top left, lesson one, the restoration invitation to be baptized during this or any other lesson do not hesitate to invite people to be baptized and confirmed where's the pressure coming from rfm it's coming from the top down like it always does and then when the caca hits the proverbial fan the top says we didn't have anything to do with it it was all the bottom's fault yeah so there you go there's gaslighting uh let's go to example number three and um, this one is the church newsroom. There, we all know now that we don't get a planet. That's the that's the fact of the matter. Uh, we don't. We used to. And I was telling, talking to Maven off off the air before we started. The whole Mormon plan of salvation hinges on you getting a planet. Don't you think, RFM? Well, absolutely. That's why we're standing on a planet right now. We're sitting on one, as the case may be. Yeah. Um, so we were supposed to get our own planet, but recently, this is within the last, say, five or six years, the Mormon newsroom came out and said uh, two different things. They said, do Latter-day Saints believe they can become gods? And do Latter-day Saints believe they will get their own planet? Uh, in return, in uh, reference to the becoming gods, it says, Latter-day Saints believe God wants us to become like him. But this teaching is often misrepresented by those who caricature the faith. The Latter-day Saint belief is no different than the biblical teaching, which states the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And then under the section, what's that? Is that Romans 8? Yeah, Uh, it is Romans 8, 16 through 17. You got it. Look at that. Somebody knows their scriptures, you lazy learner, you. Do Latter-day Saints believe they will get their own planet? No, that's the church's answer. No, this idea is not taught in Latter-day Saint scripture, nor is it a doctrine of the church. This misunderstanding stems from speculative comments, unreflective of scriptural doctrine. Hmm. Mormons believe that we are all sons and daughters of God and that all of us uh, have the potential to grow during and after this life to become like our Heavenly Father. The church does not and has never purported to fully understand the specifics of Christ's statement that in my Father's house are many mansions. Um, I think we've got a timestamp here of President Nelson saying otherwise. Um, we'll go back to this here in just a moment, Maven. I don't, I don't mean to be scattered, but I'm hoping we can show Nelson and show that it was officially taught by him and then we can keep raising the bar to show that it's taught in official correlated curriculum as well. Can we can we go back to that uh, that thing you had up before, Maven? I'm sorry. Yeah. From the church newsroom. Because this is the basis of Mormonism. I mean, as early as 1832 in Section 76, which was received by Joseph Smith and Sidney Rakedown on February 16th of that year. But that's early on. That's less than two years after the church is organized. There are passages in that revelation that say about those who inherit the celestial kingdom, then shall they be gods. OK, that's very early. And you and goes, I heard that all the time when we were members. It's what the whole structure of the thing is based upon. It was and talked also, about in gospel principles. I mean, it was as soon as you were investigating the church, you were told that's the potential. Right. Even though probably not by the missionaries. After you're baptized, that's the plan. There is a sequence in the order of the dispensing of information. There's the pre-baptism information that may be dispensed. Then there's a the post-baptism 
information that may be dispensed. And then there's the post-second anointing information that may be dispensed. And let me tell you, that's some um, good information. But the line in here that I thought was interesting is toward the end of the blue highlighted part where I really believe this gets into gaslighting. Now, where it says the church does not and has never purported to fully understand the specifics of Christ's statement that in my father's house are many mansions. What the hell is section 76? Hmm. Huh. Yeah, Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith in a room full of people at the top of the, uh, is it the Newell K. Whitney store? Or maybe it's uh, the building down the road there in Kirtland. Or uh, uh, Father Johnson's farm. Oh, that's it, the Johnson. Yeah, the Johnson farm just down the road. That's It's one of those two places because I, I went there for tours all the time. Oh, cool. I've never been. Yeah. But do you have something that shows that this is gaslighting? Where yeah. Where it says the church well, does not and is never purported to fully understand the specifics? Yep, let's start with Nelson and him talking about it. I'm game. I can tell the story at the MTC again if you want. No, no, you can, but... Now that I've started sharing it, I feel the, the compunction to continue sharing it, like the, the ancient mariner with the albatross around his neck. So here's one leader in one given instance, as uh, Elder Anderson or one of the others might say, but... We'll see how this goes. I apologize. So I no, thought sorry. I had it at the right. Oh, no, I think I do have it at the time. Is, that a, is this a Christmas devotional or does President Nelson just naturally have such big balls? <laughs> uh, it was from the stage fright of a burning down. Oh, wait, I think he was talking. That's all right. No sweat. We shouldn't talk about him. He is the prophet by, by golly. Go ahead, Maven. I'm sorry. Actually, a promise. A promise of life everlasting. This does not mean simply living for a really, really, really long time. And he would know. Everyone will live forever after death, regardless of the kingdom or glory for which they may qualify. Everyone will be resurrected and experience immortality. But eternal life is so much more than a designation of time. Eternal life is the kind and quality of life that Heavenly Father and His beloved Son live. When the Father offers us everlasting life, He is saying in essence, if you choose to follow my Son, if your desire is really to become more like Him, then in time you may live as we live, and preside over worlds and kingdoms as we do. These four. All right. So you preside over a world and kingdoms, worlds and kingdoms. Yeah. You, he's saying you don't only get one planet. Everybody not only gets a planet, they get multiple planets. Yes. And by the way, this is frequently the response from apologists that, no, we don't believe that we get one planet. We think we get you know, many, many planets. That makes gaslighting even worse. That's what I thought too. Now, why do you think that, Bill? Because you're actually taking a point that's even stronger and you've diminished it rather than it being, you know, instead of saying uh, the wall's uh, blue and now it's orange, it's the wall had all kinds of colors. There were all kinds of furniture. There were all kinds of things in the room. And nope, we're going to tell you that it was none of that. It was just the orange walls. Yeah, when they go to this extent to try and cavil about one planet while theoretically believing multiple planets that takes effort that and takes you can see why cleverness you can see why they wouldn't want to tell the public that we, mormons get lots of planets which I just know. means they're lying <laughs> i know and the problem is that they don't understand is that when they do this it's not only gaslighting and it's not only a host of other adverbs but it is also what they're showing is that they're embarrassed by it yeah. They're embarrassed by their own teachings and owning their own teachings in front of the public. And I've got to tell you, President Nelson and the other church leaders and the SEMC who monitor the show, that when you do this, you appear weak, you appear embarrassed. And it's much better just to come out and say, yes, we believe this. And in fact, if that's what they believe, they should say, no, we don't believe that we get only one planet. We believe in the course of time we will uh, preside over many planets. Yeah. You see, that's how you get people to respect your beliefs. Yeah. Now, let me say, maybe not your beliefs, but respect you 
for being honest about what it is you believe. People may still think that's the craziest thing they've ever heard of, yeah. but at least they're going to respect you for being honest about it. This right. is a, 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 a twofer in the lost category. They lose people because they are not being honest. And then they find out that over here in the 2018 First Presidency Christmas devotional and in a host of other sources, Latter-day Saints really do believe this. Which we'll get to. Again, Elder Christofferson, I think, is the one who said that uh, the doctrine is not taught by any one person. It's taught by all 15. Elder Anderson, I think, reiterated the same sort of idea uh, the very next general conference years ago. So maybe, just maybe, this is President Nelson going rogue, teaching his own ideas of Mormonism, and maybe this isn't what Mormons really believe. Maven, do you have the next one? Well, Maven's looking for that. I'll just point out the, the, the fundamental inconsistency with that statement being made by First Elder Christopherson. And even though it was made by, Go ahead, you're good. And even though it was made by Elder Anderson, if you only have two apostles saying that all the apostles have to agree for something to be doctrine, they still need 13 more to say what they've said. Otherwise, they have discounted their own statement. Yeah, and really, if you were to say these are the things that every one of the 15 at any given moment have said, you might not be able to find anything other than Christ is the Savior. That might be the only thing, because yeah. they may not have given a talk on these topics. Um, <clears throat> and so to make it so all 15 have to set, talk about it mm -hmm. would reduce the number of things we could put any emphasis on to almost nothing. Well, it sounds like that might almost be the point. It, it, I think it is. It's a deflection, right? Um, Maven, before you play this, I just, I heard the first word. I think we're maybe two seconds too late. Is there a way to back it up two seconds? If not, we'll just play it from where it's at. Perfect. In the mouth Rather of the truth. 225,000 of you here tonight. I suppose 225,000 of you may become gods. There seems to be plenty of, plenty of space out there in the universe. And the Lord has proved that he knows how to do it. I think he could make or have us help make probably worlds for all of us, for every one of us, 225,000. Just think is. of the possibilities, the potential. But wait. It gets worse. He said probably, supposedly, maybe. Maybe this one doesn't count either. Maven, I'm wondering if you could share with us some of the correlated curriculum of the church um, describing the celestial kingdom. Hey, Bill, before we leave that, could you tell, I know that Spencer W. Kimball, president of the church when I joined, do you know what year and general conference that was when um, you speaking? So this was spot. 1975 General Conference, The Privilege of Holding the Priesthood by Spencer W. Kimball. Do you know if it's April or October? Um, I don't, but I bet somebody will do us a favor and look that up and put it in the comments for us. Okay, great. Anyway, I just want to make sure for li people listening on audio later that they'll have that information. Yeah, we, we definitely want people to have all the sources because uh, we tell the truth here and we're we're as transparent as we know how to be, but it's a lot more transparent than they know how to be. I know. I'm still uh, a little bit sore over the realization I'm not going to get my own planet after all. Yep. So this book, this is the church's book. The book that we grew up with that was very similar was Gospel Principles. Gospel Principles book was more peach in color, and it was intended for investigators who had not yet been baptized. And I think they even changed it at one point to have anybody in their first year of being a member stayed in this class and got the gospel principles lessons over again. Um, but this particular manual, Gospel Fundamentals, this was used in places where the church wasn't as well organized. And it was it was the main manual used for members in countries that uh, the church hadn't developed a full presence yet. And it was to teach them the basic doctrines of the church. This is... Um, Page 201, this is towards the end, it's talking about exaltation, and this is the section on the celestial kingdom. Uh, it says, this is the place where our Father in heaven and Jesus live. It is a place where people will be happy, and it will be more beautiful than we can imagine. The people who live in this kingdom will love our Father in heaven and Jesus and will choose to obey them. They must have repented of all their sins and must have accepted Jesus as their Savior. It doesn't say anything about the second anointing, by the way. 
They must have been baptized and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. They must have a testimony from the Holy Ghost that Jesus is the Savior. To live in the highest part of the celestial kingdom is called exaltation or eternal life. To be able to live in this part of the celestial kingdom, people must have been married in the temple and must have kept sacred promises they made in the temple. They will receive everything our Father in heaven has and will become like him. We're getting Here's warmer. The money What's that? We're getting warmer, I can tell. Here, here's the money line. They will even be able to have spirit children and make new worlds for them to live on. So it's worse than we thought. When the church says you don't get your own planet, we all understood that, that we might get a used planet with 240,000 miles on it. That's not what happens. And some dinosaur we, bones. We get to create a brand new planet for ourselves. There's plenty of space out there. There's plenty of space. They will even be able to have spirit children and make new worlds for them to live on. If you make a new world for your spirit children to live on, who owns the who owns the planet? It's totally my real estate. <laughs> it's your real estate. You're a god. It's your right. planet. Um, this is in their official material. Uh, so this isn't just one leader teaching some, you know, some surface level comment about planets. Um Let's see here. Uh, Father in heaven, let's see here. Uh, they will be able to have spirit children, make new worlds for them, live on and do all the things our father in heaven has done. I'm just, yeah, I'm curious. If you make a planet, does it not belong to you? Are you leasing it? Is it like renting a book from the library, even though you're the author of the book? I mean, it's worse than they claim. It's not that you get a used planet. You get a brand new planet that you make yourself. Yeah, it's a DIY DIY, do it yourself. Like you said, take some dinosaur bones from 50 other places, put it together, and voila. Absolutely. And the other thing about being a god, where they waffle all around that without answering it and try and indicate maybe yes, but not really. They say they no. To, they, <laughs> well, they need to watch Ghostbusters. I'm telling you, SEMC people, watch Ghostbusters. You'll learn a lot. Because when someone asks you if you're a god, what do you say? You know the answer to that, right, Mr. Real? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's the answer. You say yes. Yeah. So there's another good example. Let's move on to the next one. What ha What was, there was like a book about 1984 that was about some crazy stuff happening, wasn't there? Well, yeah, it was written by George Orwell. Yeah. I think it what, might have been in the 30s that he wrote it. What was the crazy stuff that happened in that 1984? Well, the crazy stuff that happened in 1984 is that there's a dystopian uh, sort of a prediction of what society's heading for when the government is in control of information. And uh, what ends up happening is a number of things, but there's a whole lot of gaslighting going on. That's not where the phrase comes from. But the idea is that there's a certain history that everybody's experienced, a national history, whether they're at war with somebody, and that's one of the big things, right? Being at war with East Asia. Well, there was a time when this country, and I can't remember the name of the country in the book that the protagonist is in, but... Um, they change things. In other words, things happen. And then the government wants everybody to believe that it's always been this way. Yeah. So that's where the expression, we've always been at war with East, with Asia, East Asia comes from. Yeah. Because they haven't always, always been at war with East Asia. But that's what the government wants the populace to believe. And yeah. therefore, oh, what's the name of the protagonist? It's Winston something, isn't it? Anyway. I don't, I don't know. I've never read it. Yeah, he, he works in for the government and his job. And this, this is where we get the, the memory hole from. His job is to go through past publications and just sit in front of his computer screen, I think it is, uh, or maybe it's it's probably actually going through hard copies because it's written in the 30s, going through newspapers, newspapers, finding anything that contradicts the current government's uh, line, removing it from the newspaper and putting it down the chute that takes it down to the incinerator. Yeah. You just changed history. It's really weird that you tell that story because there was something similar that happened in the church. In 1984, in 1984, there was a general authority by the name of Ronald Pullman and Ronald Pullman gave a beautiful talk. It was probably, I'm guessing by the way I understand the history, it was one of the favorite talks of conference. And what he did in that talk was he separated the gospel from the church. And he said, people who were nailing the gospel, who were doing a good job of it, they, they didn't need the church. They, the church was only there to help those of us who couldn't live the gospel. And so what happened was the church wasn't very happy with his message and they ended up sending him back into the conference center. They rewrite his talk. Tabernacle. Yes. Ta sorry. The tabernacle. Cause there was no conference center yet. He, they rewrote, rewrote his talk. 
He goes back up to the pulpit. They clip out sections of his original talk to use for his new talk. Then he would put in new sections. He would say them over again, but it would be very different. And they would insert a cough track and other noises into the track so that it sounded legitimate. And then that, when you got your VHS tape of General Conference, that was the talk you got. So if you had heard Ronald Pullman originally, and then you loved the talk and you wanted to go back to revisit it, you'd be listening to it the second go around and you would be scratching your head and going like, I, this isn't how I remember it going. And you would think you're the one who's crazy. Uh, Maven, do you have Ronald Pullman's talk? Thank goodness we for the end. I'll be pleased to hear from Ronald E. Pullman of the first quorum of the 70. Now notice what happens here. Oh, this must be the actual original. Yeah, we're going to put the other one next to it here in just a second. My remarks this morning are directed primarily to those of you who have accepted the gospel and are members of the church, and to those of you who may be seriously contemplating such acceptance and membership. So far, just the original. Both the gospel of Jesus Christ and the church of Jesus Christ are true and divine. However, there is a distinction between them which is significant, and it is very important that this distinction be understood. And there is an essential relationship between them that is significant and very important. Of equal importance is understanding the essential relationship between the gospel and the church. Failure to distinguish between the two and to comprehend their proper relationship may lead to confusion and misplaced priorities with unrealistic and therefore failed expectations. This in turn may result in diminished benefits and blessings and in extreme instances even disaffection. Understanding the proper relationship between the gospel and the church will prevent confusion, misplaced priorities, and failed expectations, and will lead to the realization of gospel goals through happy, fulfilling participation in the church. Such understanding will avoid possible disaffection and will result in great personal blessings. As I attempt to describe and comment, and comment upon some on distinguishing characteristics the essential relationship between the, the gospel and the and church. The church. <laughs> Noting at the same time their essential That's relationships, good, it, it is my prayer, prayer that, a that a perspective may be developed, developed which will enhance the... In All right, let me uh, pull that off. Yeah, the amazing thing here is that um, by making these edits, what they did was they completely changed his talk 180 degrees from his original message. This wasn't just a little problem over here mm -hmm. where he said... Um, conference center instead of the tabernacle, right? It's not a little tiny thing. His entire message was devoted to the idea originally that the church is there uh, as sort of um, uh, a means, a vehicle for establishing the gospel in the members' lives and that members through devotion to the gospel will arrive at the point of maturity that they don't need the church anymore because the church has already taught them everything that the church has to teach. It's accomplished its purpose, right? And boy, they went to DEF CON 1 in uh, Salt Lake City over that. And so they did the edits, and now they have him saying exactly the opposite. You never outgrow the church. You're going to be in the church from, you know, birth to earth, from sperm to worm. You are ours. You're never going to outgrow this church. And that's what it got changed to in the redone talk. Unfortunately, the leadership of the church had not quite realized that VCRs had been invented by this time. And that there were doubtless going to be some people who on a Sunday or whatever they were doing during general conference hit the record on their VCR and went down to the bowling alley or out to the mountains or whatever it was they chose to do. And therefore, there was evidence. There was evidence of what they had done. And if there had not been evidence of what they had done, if this had happened, I don't know, 20 years before that, I'm sure it never happened before this, then all we have is our memories to go by. And here's the evidence. Well, our memory must be incorrect. Yeah. We must have remembered it wrong. Yeah. And as you point out, they're just two very different talks. One, 
gave you the freedom to use the church for its usefulness and discard it when you were done. The other one demands that you pledge loyalty and allegiance for all of your life and then probably some and pay tithing all along the way. Right. And, you know, the church has the right. <laughs> let me just be clear, OK, because I try to be fair. The church has the right to message, to give its message through its leaders. And if one of the leaders gets up there and says something that is not in line with what the church thinks, Amen. whoever it is who's, you know, reviewing and approving the talks given by the top leaders of the church, which is a, an interesting situation as it is. Who are these people? Who is this shadow government who gets to do this? Well, we know it's the people who are on the, the correlation committee. They're above the apostles when it comes to approving things. But when you get to this point, they have the right to dictate their message. But what they should do is say, Elder Pullman said some things that were not correct. And we want to take this opportunity to correct the record. He's a great guy. We love him dearly. Um, but he got this one wrong. And the that talk way, he's giving is not the original talk in full. Right, right. And so once he realized that he had given the wrong talk and he you know, was able to start walking straight again after we got done with him, he decided to record this again so it would give the correct. You, you be honest about it. You don't do this kind of crap where you secretly have them go back in, tape record it, and then put that VCR or VHS tape along with the other conference talks that were given and pretend that it never happened. And by because adding a cough track, you want the audience who now watches the VHS tape to believe that that is the original talk. Otherwise, you don't need to add the cough track. If you want to be honest, you were like, look, we don't want to deceive people. Then you don't need to add a cough track and pretend it was the actual general conference talk. Right. But they want everybody to believe that the audience is still there. When you look at it online, which you actually can go back to and look at um, on the church website, the October 1984 conference and look at it. He's not the first speaker. He's not the last speaker. He's in the middle of the session. Everybody else is still there with their original talk. And they do a few little editing tricks with his talk to make it look like he's just giving his talk the same as everybody else was. And this was the original version. It didn't all get past the cutting room floor. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about 1984, my friend. Um, karma, karma sneaks up on us sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, you couldn't write this stuff. No, you couldn't, because you and I wouldn't even wouldn't even contemplate doing it. It just doesn't like we wouldn't go like, all right, how would how are we gonna? Oh, you know what we should do? We should come up with we should have him stand back up there and give the right talk, and we'll just convince the people it's real by putting a cough track in, not telling them anything, and they won't know any better. Right. And it does make one wonder if that's the first time that this thought occurred to anybody in church leadership, since they seem to have had this ready-made solution. Yeah. You do wonder, don't you, before there was even VHS tapes, if every conference talk that came out in the conference reports is the way the person said it or gave it. Yeah. There's lots of examples of that, like over at BYU Speeches, especially. Over at BYU speeches, uh, I just know one in particular, which is where you can listen to the speech. And this, I'm thinking of the Seven Deadly Heresies mm -hmm. by Bruce, Bruce R. McConkie. Mm -hmm. You could listen to the speech and you could read the transcript of it right next to it. And there are several places where they have edited the heck out of that talk. Yeah, the but, audio version and the printed version are very different. Yeah, but at least they have the audio up there. So you can check them if you're of a mind to do that. Most people yeah. would not. Most people will read it or they'll listen to it, but they're not going to listen to it and scrutinize what they're reading at the same time to see if there are any changes. By the way, just to back up for a moment, you don't need to put it back up, Maven, but we'll just mention it. When you go now to the church's newsroom site about us not getting a planet, that's that's not there anymore. It's it's not there. But if you go to the Wayback Machine and find it, it's there. And there is a secondary site that also shows it um, that's still currently on the church's website, but it's not where any of us in America would normally find it. So is, just Is FYI, this something you can show? Because I know that this is something that had happened, I think, an hour before. Within an hour, yeah, I don't he know. I just know that I was I was preparing this. It was there, and it's not there now. Do you happen to have the original Maven, and then the uh, the other, the current page that shows that it's not? And if not, well, no biggie. We can we can move on to. It's not a not an issue. Oh, sorry, we're talking about the different um, the Wayback Machine. Those those links yeah. that you sent me. So okay. yeah. I did have them somewhere. One moment. Take your time. Great. Hey, Gene Robbins is asking, what do you guys think of evangelical protesters at conference? I know what I think. What do you think, Bill? Um, even as a 
as a deconstructed Mormon who no longer believes the church is true, and not only that, thinks it's unhealthy, I think the guy standing out in front of the Palmyra pageant, the Nauvoo pageant, making a mockery of the church and in your face with their point of view might even be more unhealthy than the Mormon church itself. Yeah, you're very eloquent. I would have just said they're assholes and left it at that. Yeah. But I, I mean, think they, you did a much better job, Bill. They were they were not, even on this side of things, I'm not a fan of that kind of proselyting. Nope, me either. All right, so this is the original where we can see that it is newsroom.churchofjesuschrist, Latter-day Saints, and it's the Latter-day Saints 101, and you've got Do They Become Gods? Um, and then just above, uh, below, oh yeah, this is the current one. So do Latter-day Saints believe they become gods? Notice that section's there, but just below it where the do you get your own planet, it is no longer there. So now there's the original from the Wayback Machine. Yep. Go forward one more time. Go to the one with both of them if you can. You just were there just a second ago with the two sections highlighted. And so there's that. Do they become gods and do they have their own planets? There's the Wayback Machine. That is the original that had it. The current one doesn't, but this is the secondary site on the church's website that still does have it. It's just that for you and I in America trying to find it, we wouldn't get to it easily. I know. And you're muted, by the way. But yes, yeah, it's insane. Wow. So so you might get your own planet. So they're gaslighting about they're gaslighting. gaslighting. <laughs> It's like Nick Fury, even his secrets have secrets. Even, even the their secrets gaslighting has gaslighting. Has yeah, even the gaslighting has gaslighting. So it's up in the air. You probably don't get a planet, but the church isn't super comfortable telling you you don't get your own planet because you might get your own planet now. Well, okay, as long as there's a hope for it. <laughs> All right, thank you, Maven, very much. All right, the, uh, the last example I've got, and then we'll turn it over to a couple from you. Um, the I've claim that Mormon... Track going. Sorry. Say that again. I've got my own cough track going. I keep trying to mute it. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to we'll have to redo this after it's over and we'll have you saying something different. The last one I want to go into is the claim that Mormonism has never been racist. If you'll pull up that uh, church periodical, No More Strangers, if you've got that handy. Oh, this is a, a remarkable example. Yeah. And if you have the actual article, great. If you don't, then uh, Stapley's... Uh, Mist and Sunday version will be fine. So this is the September 2000 uh, talk. What's? Can you go to the top and tell us who the author is? I forget his name. Uh, Elder Alexander B. Morrison of the 70. Now remember, church periodicals get a lot of review. You can't just put something in them. Those, those are heavily looked at and approved. Uh, go back down to that section then, Maven. And can I ask Maven, uh, sorry about this, Maven. Could you go to the very bottom of the article? Because I know this this doesn't sound like it was in general conference because it's in the September 2000 enzyme. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing any place where it says where it was given. Maybe it was just an article that was written for the enzyme. It is September. So September 2000 uh, is the date on it. Okay, and thank I, you. I couldn't find any audio, so I think it is just an article. Okay, now so we'll go to the highlight in a second. He says, How grateful I am that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints has from its beginning stood strongly against racism in any of its malignant manifestations. Does that, RFM, um, does the church have any issues with racism in its past in a very official way? Oh my gosh. <laughs> This is so incredible. And I remember it was incredible when it came out. I didn't realize it had been that long ago. I thought there was something that happened more recently in a similar kind of context. Yeah. Talking about that the LDS church has from its beginning stood strongly against racism in any of its malignant manifestations. Well, I guess not letting black people go to the temple or have the priesthood. How about for interracial marriage? Five years. I guess that wasn't malignant. In interracial marriage? Oh, right. That's not malignant either. Uh Dr. Lowry Nelson's letter for the, with the first presidency. That was malignant. <laughs> the 1949, uh, I think 1950 something and the 1963 or 64 first presidency letters. I'm familiar with the 49 and 69, but okay. the 49 first presidency letter, I have long thought 
was prompted by Dr. Lowry Nelson. Yeah. So uh, that to me seems just insane. There's Dr. Lowry Nelson's correspondence with George Albert Smith and his first presidency. And they reiterate in multiple places in this back and forth exchange that it is the doctrine of the church that people of color can't have the priesthood. priesthood, And they absolutely impose that it has to do with valiancy in the preexistence. And if, if a personal exchange isn't enough by the first presidency, the 1949 first presidency letter says essentially the same darn thing. Absolutely. And it was because <laughs> Larry Nelson is going back and forth with them. And I think it had to do with missionary possibility of missionary endeavors in Cuba. Yeah. And he goes down there and scouts it out. There's so many black uh, people or people descended from black people there. And he, he starts thinking, well, this isn't going to be a problem. There's great people, lots of uh, people who will probably be attracted to the gospel. And then he starts getting these letters back from the first presidency that are indicating that actually this is going to be a problem because yeah. of the black heritage and they can't hold the priesthood. And he's like, yeah. you got to be kidding me. Didn't we just fight a world war? over issues like this. So it gets very heated and very pointed. And you notice the date on that letter. There are several letters, but you saw the yeah, date and, at the top. And I got to stop, step in and just say, this is the first set of exchanges, which is between Dr. Lowry Nelson and the mission president. Then the mission president tells Dr. Lowry Nelson to work it out with the first presidency directly. So at that point, if you scroll to the further pages, um, if we can get like the signatures at the bottom. And there's the date though, that uh, June 20th, 1947, right after World War II, and right before the 1949 first presidency statement saying, it is not a matter of policy, it's a matter of doctrine in the church that black people cannot hold the priesthood. And by the way, they say it's been this way ever since the beginning, since the days of Joseph Smith. So now you're about to see this next page here, get to the bottom of that page at the bottom there, and you'll see that that's the first presidency signatures at the bottom. I just used the bottom three times in a sentence. I'm hoping not to do that again tonight. So <laughs> I think you bottomed out. Uh, yeah, you can see, go back up a little bit, Maven. Yeah, I think you went a little too far down. Uh, look at that, right, um, we're right there. Faithfully yours, the first presidency signed George Albert Smith. So the first presidency, by the way, if, if you're listening right now, following along, viewing this, and you're not aware of Dr. Lowry Nelson's correspondence with the first presidency, simply go into Google, type in 1947, Dr. Lowry Nelson, hit enter and click on the PDF. It'll be two of the top three search results and you can read it for yourself. It's a fascinating exchange. And again, you can also type in Google 1949, first presidency letter, um, and you could type in fair or fair Mormon or fair LDS and they're, uh, re showing that first pregnancy letter, though it's typed out in just text on their website, but because it's fair and they defend the church, you can pretty well trust that that's legitimate. Uh, I couldn't find an actual copy of that first pregnancy letter, but there are multiple first presidency letters that impose the racist views of the church. So from its beginning stood strongly against racism and any of its malignant manifestations, is bullshit. There's the first presidency quote. Oh, this yeah. is from the letter too. They yeah. repeat this. Yet yeah, from the days of the prophet Joseph Smith, that's from the beginning, right? Yeah. Even until now, it's been the doctrine of the church, never questioned by any of the church leaders. Maybe it should have been. Maybe that's an indictment. That the <laughs> Negroes are not entitled to the full blessings of the gospel. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that not only is this gaslighting, but it's actually using the same language. The first presidency says in 1947 and again in 1949 in their official statement that this has been the doctrine of the church from the beginning. And you've got Alexander Morrison saying in 2000 in the Enzyme, how grateful I am that the LDS church has from its beginnings stood strongly against racism. Those are and complete it's worse, opposites. And it's worse than you're saying, because if you go into the 47 exchange and then the 49 first presidency letter, they both impose that the reason they're not entitled to the full blessings of the gospel is because of their worthiness from being less valiant in the pre-mortal life. Yes, absolutely. Which the church now disavows as racist, which essentially disproves exactly what Alexander Morrison is saying. Yeah, and I can't imagine anybody listening to that and thinking... Well, I can't imagine it. If you're going to believe him, then you're going to have to discount anything that you know about the priesthood ban as not being racist. Yeah. Mormon, Mormons have a really hard time telling the truth, don't they? As you pointed out once before, Mormonism makes liars of us all. Oh, yeah. And especially if you're in the first 
um, especially if you're in leadership. <laughs> that that may be the one. <laughs> Boy, you Sayonara, led me down the baby. primrose path to that one, didn't you, Bill? I jumped off the track right before I got to the the um, abattoir. Oh yeah. The uh, yeah, the first quorum of the seventy. Yes. And there's their official statement. <laughs> August 17th, 1949. Thanks, Lowry. Here's one for you, pal. The doctrine of the church from the days of its organization to the effect that Negroes may become members of the church, but they are not entitled to the priesthood at the present time. The prophets of the Lord have made several statements as to the operation of the principle. President Brigham Young said, Why are so many of the inhabitants of earth cursed with a skin of blackness? Okay, there's racism. It comes in consequence of their fathers rejecting the power of the holy priesthood and the law of God. There's racism. They will go down to death. There's racism. And when all, by the way, here's another problem I have with the church. They always tell this prophecy of Brigham Young as if he prophesied that at some point people of color would get the priesthood. That's true, but it's only a half truth. Brigham said that they wouldn't get the priesthood until all the white people had gotten it. Here's it says right here. Um, President Brigham Young said, why are so many of the inhabitants of earth cursed with the skin of blackness? It comes in consequence of their fathers rejecting the power of the holy priest and the law of God. They will go down to death. And when all of the rest of the children, racist, have received their blessings in the holy priesthood, then that curse will be removed from the seed of Cain. And they will then come up and possess the priesthood and receive all the blessings which we are now entitled to. By the way, once you understand the actual prophecy, we now know that prophecy failed. Yes, absolutely, it did. Yeah. So Brigham Young wasn't a true prophet. But by the way, can I just uh, mention something? Yeah, please. But just to no, no, you've say got, you got, you got it right. You, they quoted the entirety of Brigham Young. Yeah. But what they do in the essay, actually in the essay on race and the priesthood on the church's website, they quote only parts of that statement mm -hmm. in order to remove the condition that everybody else has to come up and receive the priesthood before the blacks get a shot at it. Yeah. And then they use that as an evidence that Brigham Young told the truth because, hey, blacks got the priesthood eventually. He said yeah. they would eventually get the priesthood. The problem is, is that in 1978, all the white people hadn't had their chance yet. No, because I, I was born in 78 and I got the priesthood later. Yeah. It also noticed too, that by giving people of color the priesthood in 1978, the church leadership at the time effectively made Brigham Young a false prophet. You're right. They did. <laughs> You're absolutely right. They did. We've got another example they, of uh, gaslighting that also makes they them a gaslit false prophet. Brigham Young. Brigham Young got gaslit by the current leadership of the church. Man, I bet they wouldn't say that to his face. <laughs> He'd put a javelin through all 15 at once. Yeah. Yeah. That wouldn't be Will Smith uh. slapping uh, Chris Rock. That would be The Rock. Punching Chris Rock. <laughs> All right, those are my examples. I'm not even sure what that means. Actually, I, I'm under the. Uh... Uh, I have I have all these drugs in my system, and so they're they're playing havoc with my brain. Yeah, I it, it does make you wonder if the you were pointing this out. I think it was you that sent a picture in the in the thread group we're in. But if it was the Rock giving the uh, facilitating and administering the the Oscars, essentially being the guest host, it makes you wonder what Will Smith would have done. <laughs> Yeah, I think we said I'll pass on that. <laughs> Dwayne Johnson's up there flexing, and <laughs> he was in the joke. audience. He looked more shocked than anybody. Yeah, yeah. So, yep. we, so using this as a jumping-off place to my few examples Please. is that where we're going right yep. now? Yep. Okay. I had just thought of this right before the show, and it happens to deal with Brigham Young, and it happens to deal with Spencer Kimball, and in this case, it's 1976. 1976. It's October General Conference. And here's where he gaslights about the Adam God doctrine. Oh, hey, hey one, more, one more really quick thing. Just a real quick interruption. Okay. Um, I just want to note, too, at the one time the church leadership boasted that its hospital that did blood transplants didn't have any blood from people of color, that it was all clean blood. Again, deep racism inside the church against what Brother Morrison had to tell us. Anyway, oh, continue. Good point. Good point. In their minds at the time, I'm sure it was a feature and not a bug. <laughs> but this is, you know, that what a great expression that is. I've got oh. unlimited use out of it. Um, so here's the thing. They're having trouble with the Adam-God theory getting out there and people finding out about it. 
And Spencer Kimball decides that he's going to, in a very carefully crafted statement, gaslight members of the church who might have heard about it or read Brigham Young's words into trying to get the, into trying to get them to believe that no, he never said that. And this is where he says, by the way, Maven, do you have that link I sent you? I'll, I'll read it to you, but we also have the link, I hope. We warn you, this is Spencer Kimball. We warn you against the dissemination of doctrines, which are not according to the scriptures and which are alleged to have been taught by some of the general authorities of past generations. Such, for instance, is the Adam-God theory. We denounce that theory and hope that everyone will be cautioned against this and other kinds of false doctrine. Now, I have parsed this statement before and shown you how it is intentionally trying to give one impression that Brigham Young never taught it and no other church leaders ever taught it without ever actually coming out and saying that, if you know what I mean, because he used the words alleged there. But the entire purpose of this is to gaslight people and say, no, Brigham Young never taught this. No other church leaders ever taught the Adam God theory. Do you have the, um, the video of that, Maven? It was 1976 General Conference. Oh, Hi, how you doing? Yes, I do. Okay, sorry. There was so much reference material for this one. I think this is what we are looking for. It'll start as soon as I put it up. You're doing Thanks, a Maven. hell of a job, Maven, by the way. We did. We had about 47 things for you to keep track of. You're doing great. And I loaded 46 of them like within an hour <laughs> of showtime. That was my fault. But I did look it up. I did look it up. I think this is what you want. Um, it's at the four minute mark. Not that one. That's 78. Oh, that is not it. Um, it's the one I don't from 1976. I don't think I have it. RFM. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. Those are the words there. It was reprinted in November of 1976 in Zion with all the other conference talks. You can listen to it if you want. But that's exactly what he said. So I think that that is an example of gaslighting. Now, did you have anything you want to say about that, Bill? Um, uh, I'm kind of all over the place myself at the moment, but, um, there was something I don't remember at the moment, so we can just continue. Sorry. Okay. Well, here's one of the things that has long been a pet peeve of mine. And I talked with you about this many years ago, Bill, which is that sometimes neo-apologists, specifically Patrick Mason, sometimes Terrell Gibbons, excuse me for a second. I'm sorry. I do remember, by the way, so catch, you know, clear your throat. Um, what they do. Oh, I was going to say, say Bruce R. McConkie is in, there's places of him responding to people asking the question about Adam God, and he tells them that Brigham never taught it. But later on, when Eugene England is having a conversation with them, Bruce R. McConkie in his snarky tone tells Eugene England, you don't think I know this stuff? Like, yes, I know Brigham Young taught it. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, Bruce R. McConkie on the record contradicting himself and essentially admitting that he was lying to people who were more naive because he, he didn't have, he assumed that they weren't smart enough to figure it out and hence he could get away with it. Yeah. His first statement on the, the most famous statement is in the seven heresies, the seven deadly heresies. And actually, if you go back and parse that out, you will find out that he never actually denies that Brigham Young said it, just like Spencer Kimball never actually denied that Brigham Young said it. And the reason why is Spencer Kimball knows he taught it. Bruce R. McConkie admittedly knows he taught it. And so they're trying to choose their words very carefully, kind of like lawyers, in order to obfuscate that fact at the same time as giving the impression that Brigham Young never taught it. Exception all around. Yeah. And the reason that I point that out is because that takes real effort to try and give a false impression while you're saying something that later on, if you get caught, you can argue that you weren't lying. Yeah. All right. So there's another thing here. Oh, this was about Terrell Gibbons and Patrick Mason. One of the things that they will do is they will want to push back against some doctrine or other in the church, like whether the prophet is doctrinally inerrant. Okay. And they can't quote the leaders of the church and push back against it because, well, you know why, Bill, right? You can't criticize leaders of the church. Even if the criticism church. is true. Exactly. So what they do, and I've, I've heard several instances of this, what they will do is they will completely omit the leadership of the church from their discussion. And instead, they'll say, somehow the members of the church got this wrong idea into their head. We don't know well, where that came from. Right. 
because they don't get pushed back on it, even though I'm yelling at the um, the podcast, right, or whatever it is that I'm listening to, even though I'm yelling at it and saying, well, where do you think they all got the same idea in their head? They got it from the leaders of the church. Right. That's gaslighting, I think, because what it's doing is it's blaming the members of the church for getting an idea that they're going to say is wrong while ignoring the fact that the reason that the members of the church have this idea is because of the leaders of the church are the ones who taught it to them. Now, I have an example of this. It's a little bit different. It's quite subtle. This was back a couple of years ago when we had Patrick Mason on the show. And uh, 54 minutes, not this show, but another show we were recording, Bill really got in this interview with Patrick Mason. He was very giving of his time. He gave us several hours. And unfortunately, the recording only went to 54 minutes and then it dropped the rest. Both on You and I both end. recorded it and we both only had 50 minutes of it. It was very frustrating. To this, day. To, to this day, I think it would have been the best podcast episode at, up to its up to its time. And I'm just, I was so devastated that we lost it. It was upsetting. And it's hard to argue against that proposition you just made since it's gone forever. So it definitely was the best. In fact, it was the best episode that's ever been done anytime, anywhere. And it all got lost. So here's the thing. Fortunately, right before the end of this interview, what we have re remaining, I apologize. Patrick Mason does the same thing. And he does it in the context of talking about a fundamentalist or literal interpretation of the scriptures because I'd been busting his chops pretty good about the book of Abraham and talking about it in the literal sense, literally written by a literal Abraham and all these other things that the church has taught from the time it came out, right? Um, 1835 and 1842 and ever since, very, very literal. And now Patrick Mason is going to push back against that on me. And he's going to say, well, this is the problem is this literalist interpretation that you're advocating. And actually, actually, this literalistic interpretation came into the church from fundamentalist evangelicals or evangelical fundamentalism. And he says it came into the church a couple hundred years ago. And then you, you, my beamish boy, you jump in at about the one minute mark after he says this and you say, well, hang on a second. I don't think it's fair to blame the members for getting this idea in their head, right? Because that's what he's doing. He wants to leave aside the leaders who are the most literalistic kinds of teachers about the scriptures. I mean, he tries to carve out an exception for Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. And Brigham Young's the guy who says, when the Bible says that Jesus is the son of God, that means he's really literally the son of God. He's not begotten by the Holy Ghost. He's begotten by God the Father. You don't get a lot more literal than that. But then you push back. But then he immediately concedes the issue. He immediately concedes the issue, which tells me that this is purposeful on his part. He is trying to leave the leaders out of it, put it on the members, even though he knows the leaders are responsible. Otherwise, I don't think he would immediately concede the issue once you push back on it. Do we have the tape for that? It's about three minutes long. It's great listening. Yeah, I think so. And, and for me, the whole key is that we don't have to read scripture like fundamentalist Protestants do. I mean, you know, sort of all of the assumptions behind even the conversation we've had for the past 45 minutes, uh, it, these are assumptions about scripture that come from fundamentalist Protestantism. Uh, this is not the way Catholics read scripture throughout history. This is not the way uh, I think even that Joseph Smith or Brigham Young read scripture. But but the way that we're thinking about it in terms of the literalism, the historicity, uh, all these kinds of things, this presupposes a certain reading of scripture and approach to scripture that comes that is a very modern thing and basically comes to us through evangelical fundamentalist Protestantism over the past couple of hundred years. And I think Mormons don't have to read scripture that way. I don't feel captive to read scripture uh, the way that fundamentalist, uh, you know, my fundamentalist friends read the Bible. Um, and right. so I'm perfectly comfortable with the scholarship that suggests there's no such person as Job, but it's still scripture. So I'm perfectly comfortable yeah. with, with saying, you know, that the scriptural production that is in the voice of Moses or Abraham doesn't actually have to be the voice of, of Moses or Abraham to be scripture, even if that's what Joseph Smith thought, because, again, he was operating in a particular cultural context of the way that scripture worked. Perfect. And, and I, I want to just make a comment here so that we acknowledge it's not the member's fault that we have done that. Like if we're honest no, with ourselves okay. and I'm hoping I'm asking you to agree or not agree. Mormonism institutionally imposed the scriptures that way. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. 
Um, and this is, this is part of a particular, especially 20th century history of the way that we have read scripture, bringing the young read scripture in a totally different way. Uh, and if anybody's interested, they should go read Phil Barlow's book, Mormon, Mormons and the Bible. Um, but this is a 20th century, uh, uh, essentially construct or product that we have where we learned to read scripture and doubled down on certain claims, be, which I think were more or less learned or imported uh, from other religious traditions who had a you know pretty strong influence on the way that Americans read scripture or thought that a, a scripture should be read. Uh, but that's not the only way to read scripture. Notice, by the way, RFM, that he's hinting at, he doesn't want to say it directly because he also knows which side of his bread is buttered on, but he uh, hints at the fact that the Book of Mormon is not historical and we don't have to think that, that, that Mormon canon isn't historical, but he doesn't want to say it. He uses the New Testament and the Old Testament as examples, uh, specifically the Old Testament, as an example of it not being having to be understood literally or historically, um, but he's referencing it as a way to show about Mormon scripture, which he won't touch with a 10-foot pole. Right. The other thing about Brigham Young is uh, one of his famous quotes, at least one that I'm familiar with, was he talked about how he interprets scripture. And he says, here's how I interpret scripture. The scriptures say what they mean and they mean what they say. Nothing literalistic about that. No, not at all. OK, uh, are those? Oh, you me, I'm so sorry. I, I was waiting for you to come up with another great one. No. Yes. So I've got one other thing to say, please. OK. This has to do with uh, the church hiding things and whether it's a rock in a hat with the translation process, whether it's Joseph Smith's pervasive polygamy, uh, people are shocked every day to find this out, that they were never taught this, that they never read about this. They, they never heard about it in any of their church meetings or firesides or whatever. And they're forties, fifties. And where has this stuff been? Why haven't I been told this? And they're shocked by it. Well, almost as sure as the sun rises, and I apologize once again. Thank God for the mute button. Almost as sure as the sun rises, when you share that with somebody else who is an apologist, they're going to give you a certain response. And that response is usually going to be, what are you talking about? I've known about this my whole life. This has been talked about in church. You just didn't study, right? You just never studied. Now, I want to say something about that. First off, it always has to be fine for a person to share their personal experience, okay? Just like the first person sharing their personal experience, everybody has the right to share their personal experience. My concern is that when the second person is sharing their personal experience to the degree that it is being used to invalidate the personal experience of the first person who got shocked to find out about these things, that's when it goes into gaslighting territory. And I've seen this happen a number of times. And my feeling is that more often than not, that's exactly the purpose of expressing this differing view is to discount the validity of the other person's experience. And that's why I consider this to be a case of gaslighting. Your thoughts? Yeah, just that if I were to go be back prior to the gospel topic essays. And I were to tell you, RFM, go find me one correlated instance in the curriculum where we are told that Joseph Smith married plural wives. Um, wouldn't be able to find it unless you use family search. You couldn't. I mean, there's a couple of references in a little book called Mormon Doctrine, yeah. which is, of course, a reference book, and it's several hundred pages long. Correlated uh, curriculum. Right. And it's not correlated. By the way, it wasn't even published by Deseret Book. Yeah, I believe it was published by Bookcraft, a and, private publishing company. And, and to make that point, I'll make it simple. We were told over and over and over again about how that young little girl, Mary Elizabeth Rawlings Leitner, saved up the Book of Commandments in her in her dress because the mob was trying to destroy them, and she was the one who got us to be able to keep that production. And yet, she's a plural wife of Joseph Smith, and you're not told anywhere. And you would think in your religion that you would somewhere along the way also learn this, a fact that that girl ends up becoming a plural wife of the founder of your religion, and it's nowhere. We don't learn about uh, Fanny Alger. We don't learn about uh, the Partridge sisters. We don't learn about the Lawrence sisters. We don't learn about Lucy Walker. We don't learn any of it. 
And so for people who say, oh, I always knew that. Well, maybe, maybe you had a seminary teacher who read as much as RFM or read as much as Bill Real. Maybe. Uh, and somebody asked something and that person was just being honest, but it was never intended to be taught. And there's no way you can show me in correlated curriculum that it was. In fact, when we get here to the conclusion, we'll see another example of them claiming that you had access to something, but you didn't. Okay. Well, that's about, that? you, you yeah, wanna... that's about all my comments that I had to contribute on this subject. Awesome. Thank you for bringing those in. By the way, I don't know how you do it. You're you're just brilliant. Yeah, we're sitting here kind of getting ready to do the show. And over the course of the last 24 hours, you're like, hey, I just thought of this one. Hey, I just thought of that one. They were great ones to add in and um, add a ton to the show. So appreciate appreciate your part. Thank you, Bill. Um, the great ones make it look easy. That's right. And, and a big prop to Maven for helping us make it look easy sometimes. Yeah, so Maven. Thank you. thank you. Yeah. All right, Maven, let's do the last one. And when you start the clip, I want you to pause it immediately after Elder Oaks gets done talking, which is pretty quick. And then we'll talk about that and then we'll show the conclusion. And then we got a special song at the end. So I've been hiding that for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, right there. So we're going to get into what Elder Ballard has to say. Um, and we'll use this as a conclusion. It is one more example of gaslighting. But if you remember this talk, Elder Oaks is making a joke about the 1970 article by James B. Allen about the first vision. And he talks about how, well, we've been hiding that for a long time, ha, 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 you know? And the reality is they're still hiding it. It's not on the church's website. The only way you can find it is by going off the church's site and finding it in secondary sources. So the very example he uses to say that you Latter-day Saint youth have always had access to this talk those of Latter-day Saint youth, if, if I was in the crowd, I would have raised my hand or I might have screamed out loud if they wouldn't call on me. And I would say, Elder Oaks, let's do a little test. All of the youth here in this room, would you mind pulling your devices out and trying to find that James Allen 1970 talk? And I can almost guarantee that not one of those youth would have been able to do it. They couldn't have found it on the church website because it's not there. The one place that I knew where it was was on Mormon Think. Yeah. They've been, they've been hiding that for a long time. And this, what makes this especially troublesome to me is that we know the history, which I'm not going to go into detail, which is that the 1832 account of the first vision came to the attention of Joseph Fielding Smith, the church historian, probably sometime in the 1930s. He has it cut out of the book, sticks it in his safe, hides it, won't let anybody look at it unless they get special authorization from the first presidency, apparently. Hides it, hides it, hides it. In the 1960s, news of its existence leaks to the public. He gets shamed publicly by the Tanners into taping it back into the book, bringing it to the attention of Paul Chessman, a guy working on his master's thesis at BYU, so he can include it. And then the Tanners, by the way, the Tanners are the first people to publish this. And they get it out of the master's thesis, right? Yeah. So the anti-Mormons are the first people to publish the 1832 account of the first vision. I don't consider it being typed in a master's thesis that's never published to be a publication. But they're the first people to actually publish it. And that's the history of the 1832 account of the first vision. And then because it was forced open and it's making a stir, then they have to have James Allen write an article about the different accounts of the first vision, including the 1832 account, which did appear in the 1970 improvement era, the immediate predecessor to the Enzyme magazine, which had a name change, I think, uh, a year later. Okay, so having said all of that, with that background for Elder Oaks, to sit there in front of that audience and talk about, well, you, we know that Elder Ballard saying we've never hidden anything from anybody. They know damn good and well that they have. And for Elder Oaks to make a joke and say, well, wh what date was that article? And he goes, oh, 1970. And he says, oh, we, we've been hiding that for a long time. They're still hiding it. It's not there. Right, right. <laughs> and they completely hid it for decades before that. Yeah. And, so and that's if I'm so disingenuous. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. And if my count is right, that was gaslighting example number nine. And with our conclusion, with, this will be gaslighting example number 10. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it's, this, it's this, this, this idea that the church is hiding something, that, which we would have to say as two apostles who have covered the world and know the history of the church and know the integrity of the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve from the beginning of time, there has been no attempt on the part in any way of the church leaders trying to hide anything from anybody. 
Now we've had the Joseph Smith papers. That's, that's good enough. We didn't have that's those. Fine. And the more I see that the, uh, the video, the more upset I get by yeah, the faces too. of the youth who are actually buying what he's saying. They believe him. They are innocent. They are naive. They trust him. And that's the situation that unscrupulous people use in a leadership or authoritative position to gaslight other people. Yeah. And it, and you're right. It hurts. It, it feels like trauma. It, it feels like something inside is infected because these guys continually put across a narrative and folks like Patrick Mason go ahead and give it lip service and try to help them out. And nobody, none of those guys, cause they, cause then they'd be us. They'd be on this side of things. If any of those guys stood up, um, I've heard, I've heard one apologist who everyone would recognize the name. And in private conversation, that apologist said that the church is a thoroughly corrupt bureaucracy. Meanwhile, his books are sold at Deseret Book, and uh, he says all the right things in front of people uh, because that's the game those guys play. And uh, when those guys say they're as honest as they know how to be, it's just not very honest. And gaslighting imposes trauma on people, and it's not right. Um, we'll go to some phone calls, and then we're going to play a special musical number. I did want to show... Um, I did I put several jump in real quick. Oh, please, please, Maven. Um, I just did want to point out that Thrive for Women is this weekend. If you are needing to get away from a different Your husband. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Um, and I don't have the website ready for that, but I'll see if I can get it and put it in the links. Please. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And once again, general conferences this weekend. Uh, my latest understanding is that the women's session is still on, though that's subject to change without a moment's notice. And also this uh, Saturday at 1.30 p.m. Florida time, I'll be presenting on at the Thrive there. They're having a bunch of different Thrives again this weekend at different locations. And the subject is, what, what is it? It's uh, reclaiming your power, the cave and the labyrinth, something hopefully mm. mysterious to get people to want to come and listen. Mm. Good, good. And then just a note too, the uh, analogy I used earlier about the blue room and the orange room, that is in an article, uh, a document put together by Claudine uh, Foodray. And if you look in the comments, wherever you're watching this, that link is showing up right now. And she lists multiple other examples of gaslighting as well. Again, literally, it's not like we cherry picked five examples or 10 examples. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of these um, but we tried to pick the ones that we thought were the most entertaining. If you go into uh, Claudine's document, you'll see another maybe 15 or 20 of them given there. Um, so there's that. And so now we'll go to the victory for Satan segment of the show. 662-667-666, Mark of the Beast, and a seven at the end, uh, or just 662 Mormons with an S on the end. Uh, and we can go to a couple of phone calls and I think... I will have one of those here. Let's do this. You almost got to see the switchboard for a second. Quick almost. Hide that. Yeah, if someone pauses it, they'll get to see the switchboard. The, ga the gaslighting will continue until the morale improves. That's right. All right. So I don't see any uh, information here, but caller, you're on the line. Uh, what do you have for us tonight on Mormonism Live? Ooh, good boy. Hey, uh, I just want to give my example of gaslighting. And uh, I actually was tweeting Maven about this the other day, but redefining the word translate is a total sidestep. It drives me crazy. The Book of Mormon wasn't a translation, it was a divination. The JST wasn't a T, it was plagiarism. The Book of Abraham wasn't a translation, it was a fabrication. But my fault for misinterpreting all those lessons and the correlated curriculum and all that just drives me nuts. Thank you very much, caller. Great example. Great example. Wait, are they still there? I, I if they want oh, to I, share it, I'm curious. Uh, I, I hung up on Twitter. them. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, In so the sorry. chat, I'm curious. Uh, the Twitter handle, or you can message me. Okay, Mes I, message I Maven. Know. Put it in the put your Twitter handle out there. <laughs> um, I just want to note too. Um, there were several years ago that I, my source on the inside said, Bill, be on the lookout. They're going to start using the word revelation in place of translation. And if you watch carefully, and I, unfortunately, I, I wish I would have, but there's at least been five or six examples thus far in the last three years. Um, I wish I would have accumulated those because it would be a fun episode to do to show each time they did it. But there are multiple places now where the church is slowly baiting and switching the word uh, translation for revelation, because a revelation is just 
It's just, just magic out of a hat. And you can say anything and it's not connected to anything. It's all inside here. Whereas translation uh, is you taking an existing document of some sort, whether you have it in front of you or not, and claiming to put it into readable language of the people you're translating it for. And those are two very different concepts. And you're seeing the church make that switch in real time right now. Good point. And I remember several years ago, you're bringing that up and brought it up publicly as well, even as a prediction of sorts from some mysterious inside source that you claim to have. There we go. All right. Our next caller, you're on Mormonism Live. Hey, this is JP. Can you hear me? I can hear you, JP. Okay, great. Your last name wouldn't happen to be Patches, would it? Yeah, you're welcome. No, I'm I'm afraid not. No. Okay. Um, I wanted to uh, make a little bit of a callback to the episode you had with Kara Burrell. You talked about some Sam Harris stuff. And we're talking about gaslighting as a narrow slice of specific kind of lie. Sam Harris uh, has this idea that I picked it up from him. It's probably in other places that lying is actually a form of low-grade violence. And uh, I wondered if, uh, Bill and RFM, if you maybe just speak to that idea. How do, you, how do you parse that out as far as is lying violence and uh, what what do we make of the church then uh, and, and its uh, ec- economy with the truth? Awesome. Thank I'll you. take my answer off the air. Perfect. Um, I will say, RFM, that when you lie, you prevent people from having a, the fullest picture. And when you prevent people from having the fullest picture, you are reducing or taking away their agency. Again, we can argue, Sam Harris, there is no free will, but forget that. Let's assume the church is true. Let's assume free agency is an important principle in the gospel. If we lie to people within the church, we reduce their ability to have access to a full table of information to make informed decisions. When you could have had all the information, but that information has been reduced, it's not all visible to you, then your agency has been compromised. And in a church that values agency with its lip service, but um, its checks that don't cash uh, seem to say otherwise, then what we end up with is a church that uh, doesn't really believe in the principles it espouses. And when I am living a life, giving all my talents, time, energy, resources, uh, money to the building up of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and that entity, that same entity, doesn't allow me to make fully informed choices, uh, it hurts. And when something hurts, I'm okay having a conversation about whether that's verbal violence. Okay. You want me to chime in? Please. Yeah. I disagree completely with that idea. Words are never violence. I don't care how extreme they are. I don't care if they make you cry or whatever. Words are not violence. Violence is violence. When we start calling language violence, we open the door to being able to suppress language that we don't like. And that is the path to dictatorship. This country is built upon the idea of free expression, free expression. That's why we got the First Amendment, right? There are some exceptions to that, like shouting fire in a crowded theater. So there's some extreme exceptions to it. But I, I do not consider words to be violent. So I was raised with a, uh, a saying. I don't know if anybody today has heard of it. It was called sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never harm me. That's how I was raised. And I think that's a good way to be. If you want to go back to last Sunday night at the Academy Awards, what Chris Rock said was not violence. What Will Smith did was violence. That's the difference in my view. And I respect that. And to some degree, I agree with it. I will also just say that sometimes things that are said carry with you longer and hurt a whole hell of a lot more than some physical acts. Oh, and I agree with that. Believe me. Uh, but I still don't think it makes it violence. Sure. Okay. So even sometimes RFM and Bill Real disagree. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know what Bullwinkle said? What's that? Well, he says, I I love violence. And then who was it? Was it Boar saying, you mean you like trees falling? Boom. Buildings coming over. You know, warfare. Kaboom. And he goes, no, I like violence because they smell so nice. Violence. (laughs) All right. Now we've got... uh, Two more callers. Caller, you're on Mormonism Live. Hello? Hi, Bill and RFM. How are you doing? Good, good. You're right. 
great hi my name's wall i would just I'm, I'm curious your thoughts it feels like the i guess the the blatant nature of the the church's falseness is getting more and more apparent and maybe that's just me personally but i feel like you had like monson and hinkley who were these bureaucrats that came up in the church and now you have nelson who kind of i mean i mean when you give a surgeon the when you tell a surgeon he can be speaking for god like you know god complex up to up to 10 and i'm wondering if you you who have been you know, watching this a little bit longer uh do you feel like that uh the i guess the church is pushing people out in a more accelerated fashion now or do you think it's maybe just a uh, that each each generation has their own people that drive them out. Yeah, we'll hang up with you and we'll respond, okay? Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I thought November 2015 would have been the precipice moment where the most people left, and then little by little it would have gone down from there. My gut is, watching all the anecdotal evidence around me, again, I don't know the numbers. We'll hear them again in another week. I don't know that I'll believe them, but we'll hear them. Um, my, my gut is by the number of people who, uh, follow us, who follow Mormon stories, who, uh, share their resignation letters on Reddit X Mormon, the growth of the X Mormon subreddit and 50 other pieces of anecdotal evidence. My hunch is that there are more people leaving today than yesterday. But not as much as tomorrow, but not as much as tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Those Amen. i go reference anyway. Yeah, I think that what I heard some time back, a number of years ago, when there were, I mean, how many, how many instances do we have to have of resignations going on? Remember, just like mass resignations in November of 2015? We have bimbo eruptions every year or so in the church. And that's a reference, of course, back to Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton. But we have these eruptions that come up that are very damaging to the church that have to be managed in some way. And the church does a horrible job of managing it because mostly they're gaslighting or not really dealing with the issues at all. They're busy rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic is what they're doing. But having said that, I think that every time something like this happens, you've got a core membership of the church. Then you've got a group around that that maybe is not quite so core. Then you got people out there who are on the fringe. They're hanging on by their toenails, maybe, even if they don't know it. And every new one of these eruptions that happens pushes the people who are on the fringe out. But it also expands the people from the inside so that the other people start moving out to where they're hanging on by their toenails as well. So there's this movement from the center out. And every new time it happens, those people who have now been moved out by prior incidents, they leave. So I think this is ridiculous in nature, if I'm using that expression correctly. It keeps happening. And I think that the church is going to continue to lose members until they figure out that really all the members want to do is to be respected by the leaders of the church and have that respect manifested in the church leaders being honest with them and telling them the truth. Yeah. Um, just to go back to the language as violence, I actually think we agree from a legal standpoint, I agree with you. From a legal standpoint, you can't censor language because you're then you're on the fast track to something other than democracy, right? I'm I'm speaking from solely a psychological harm point of mm -hmm. view. And while we can't censor language legally because of what that would lead to, I'm simply saying from a psychological level, language can do a whole lot of damage. Oh, yeah. And I certainly agree with that. I mean, there are yeah. things that have happened in my life that were purely emotional or language yeah. that live with me to this day. And of course, also, I got to say, though, when you get good and punched in the face like Chris Rock did, when that sting goes away and the jaw is reset and you recover completely physically from it, that doesn't mean the injury is over. Yeah. Right. There's yeah. still damage that you've got to live with. Amen. Amen. All right. Last call of the night. You are on Mormonism Live and uh, take us home, my friend. Yes. Hi, you guys. First of all, thanks for all you do. I really appreciate your your um, shows. They're awesome. Thank so you. Thanks. Um, 
Sure. I just wanted to talk about the Ron Pullman story that you said, because that was a huge breaker for me. Um, I can remember that talk. I was back in, like, just out of high school when he gave that talk. And um, I was doing devotionals and things at the time for youth, and I, I wanted to use that talk in my devotional. And so I couldn't wait for the ensign to come out so I could get a copy of it. And I was so shocked. When I couldn't find it, I looked, I listened to his talk again. I could, I started to second guess myself, just like you're talking about. And I couldn't find the talk. And I started thinking, well, maybe it was a different conference. And I looked in past issues and I never could find the talk. So all these years later, when my husband came to me with problems about the book of Abraham and I started to do a little investigating, I came across that talk. And I was, I was just blown away. I can't believe the church could be so deceitful. You know, there was no, the whole contract thing. Yeah. Yeah. How did that make you feel? I felt like I didn't trust them anymore. Like I, it made me want to dig and go, what else are they hiding? Which of course opened a huge can of worms because there's so much when you really start looking, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was a biggie for me. So I'm glad you guys brought that up. I hope, you know, people really realize how much, you know, this gaslighting is really a problem. You know, cause like I said at the time, I really spent a lot of time trying to find that talk and I never could find it. Yeah. Yeah. How frustrating. I had a similar incident happen uh, when I was talking with a former bishop of mine and he was pretty open minded. And I was talking to him about Joseph Smith and the experience he had with, um, sorry, I had that. Uh, Pelatia Brown. Wow. Pelatia Brown was the name of the guy in the church. Uh, he said, Pelotia Excuse me. Pelatia Brown. I think it's Pelatia. It could be Pedalia, but I think it's Pelatia Brown. And the reason why it's famous is because, to me, it was famous is because Pelatia Brown had been giving an interpretation of the beast in the book of Revelation, which the high council where he was talking uh, did not agree with. So they did a church disciplinary court on him for teaching false doctrine. And Joseph Smith intercedes on his behalf and says, um, what does he say? He makes some wonderful statements uh, uh, about it doesn't prove a man is a bad man just because he errs in doctrine. I like the freedom of believing what I want to believe. It feels so good not to be trammeled. Okay, so this wonderful statement about religious freedom, even within his own church. Now, he didn't always practice what he preached in that one instance, but it's a very important story. And I mentioned that to my uh, my bishop. And he says, oh, where can I find that? And I said, well, you can find that in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, I'm sure. I'd read it a couple of times, but not recently. So he goes and he grabs it and he looks it up in the back and there's an index in the back. It's not very extensive, but it does have Pelatia Brown's name. So he knew where to look and he reads through this account. He doesn't find it. He doesn't find it. He's reading through it. He's not finding what I'm saying. He brings it to me uh, probably in the third hour and says, I've looked through this. I can't find it. Can you show me? And I look through it. I can't find it. But you know what I do find? I find a page that has a break in the paragraphs and a series of asterisks across it. Because Joseph wow. Smith, when he combined or correlated or, I'm sorry, assembled, teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, which he did back in the 1930s as the church historian. He didn't like that. Joseph Smith said that so much that he removed it from the story when he put it into teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. That guy's removed a lot of things. Yeah. And that kind of (laughs) hacked me off. I've talked about this before, but, (laughs) but your story reminded me of that because I was looking for it. I knew it was there. But then I started doubting myself. Did I did I get this wrong? Did he say it in some other context? I saw the asterisk. Same here. Yeah. Then I went to another source and I found, yeah, that's exactly what Joseph Fielding Smith removed from the story. Because wow. apparently Joseph Fielding Smith did not have such liberal ideas about people being good people, even if they make a mistake about doctrine and wanting the liberty of believing how they choose. Yeah. Just FYI. It well, and they continue to do it. They continue to do this all the time. And, you know, I've even heard, I haven't looked myself, but, and you guys probably know this, but I've even heard that they've removed like the footnotes to the essays that they have on their website. Is that true? I think I've made that claim before because people have told me that. And when I go to find them, I, 
I quickly look and they're not there, but they've made them reachable a different way. And it's a little harder to get to them. So it kind of, it kind of more hidden, but not really hidden. Yeah. I think what you mean is that it and used so to be. Kind of, I, I think that's it kind used, of the damning part of the essays. Yeah. Yeah. A lot so of people have, have, have gotten so many things. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize. Thank you, Colin. I apologize. Um, no, I was just going to say so many things are taken out of context, you know, and the footnotes are, are really revealing of that. Yeah. yeah, for instance, if you take that footnote in the Race and the Priesthood essay that goes to Brigham Young and it gives a source for it, if you actually just look up that source, which you can do with Google, they don't have Journal of Discourses on the church's website either for some reason, but you can find it elsewhere. And if you look it up, then you're going to find out that what he really said was not just that at some day in the future, blacks would be able to hold the priesthood, that what he really said was someday in the future, after all the white people have had the chance to hold the priesthood, then the blacks turn will come. That's what they don't want you to find. And so what they did was, I, my recollection is, is that they had these as footnotes originally, like footnotes are, they're at the foot, they're at the bottom of the, the paper, right? And they also have links to each footnote in the body of the article. So if you click the link, it takes you down to the footnote at the bottom, that kind of thing. My understanding is that that has changed and they took out the footnotes at the bottom. So there are no footnotes at the bottom, but they still have the links on each of the footnote numbers in the body of the text. If you click on that link, then it opens up a side window where it has that one reference to whatever it is you might be looking for. Does that sound right, Bill? Yeah, they don't want you reading all of them, do they? No, they don't. And in fact, I mean, somebody's head has got to roll for the bright idea of putting these up there on the church website. And some of those footnotes say the very opposite of what they're claiming the footnote says in the gospel topic essay. Uh, Book of Abraham, I think there's one for sure. Um, just such a strange thing. that This is, it's weird. The further away you get from this church, the harder time I have differentiating it from other false high demand fundamentalist religions like Scientology or Jehovah's Witnesses. Like the same games are being played. I would expect a church that holds Jesus Christ up as its leader to be doing a better job of being honest. And again, they're just not doing that great. Yeah. Doug Vincent is saying the footnotes are still there and they may be now, Doug, I could be totally wrong in my recollection. It changes day to day. He's gaslighting me. Damn it. Doug, you're totally gaslighting me. No, it does. It changes day to day. And so there are sometimes when they are there, sometimes when they're not, and this has occurred ever since they've been put up there periodically where changes are made. So there's that one on the side. So it would not surprise me, Doug, if the footnotes are now there when you access it, but I'm not sure that that is uh, concrete evidence that there wasn't a time in the past when they had taken them out and just put them on the side. Will you go all the way to the bottom, Maven? Let's just see what's down there. Yeah. Nope. So you're right. As oh, of right now, you, you click the number, it comes up on the side and it's one at a time. Hey, Doug, look at that. Did you, did you access the one about Abraham? Because it does appear that there are no footnotes at the bottom of that paper. They're only available through the links on the side. You might have looked at a different one. I'm not sure. And he might be using a mobile device or something, too. It may be different for the gospel library on a, on a phone versus what it is on a computer. Yeah, and the app, right? The gospel yeah. library app, sometimes it, it's different. All right. Anything else from you guys? Maven, great job, by the way. RFM, great job. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. I had a great time too. Maven looks like she's in a trance of some sort. Sorry, I forgot I'm on the air. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you guys uh, have nothing else, we'll play a little music uh, ditty for everybody. All right. I'm looking forward to this. Here we go. The Mormon church is so dumb. Nope. I can't hear it. I can't hear it either. Nope. When you muted yourself, Bill. This Good. is a great song. I like it, though. By the way, should we just say at the outset, give credit where credit? This is by Weird Alma. There it is. Weird Alma, prophet of the new disputation. And I can't hear you now, Bill. I think Bill is just moving his mouth and making me think I'm going deaf. He's gaslighting. No, no, it's yeah, I'm gaslighting you. I'm trying to be a, a, a ventriloquist or something. Let me add it again. I don't want to have it. Sometimes when I have my sound and the screen sound. There's like a double noise and I don't want to have that. So let's, let's knock this out and try to get it the right way. Okay. Share audio. I'm going to mute me and give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. Problematic. 
All right, here we go. The Mormon church is so dogmatic. No. Oh, traumatic. When the Man, that... Right all right, let's do this some other way. Let's see here. Add to stream. Any, like repeating or echoing. I'm not. All right, let me try it one more time. This is really worth the wait, folks. The Mormon church is so dogmatic. It's really problematic. It can feel so traumatic. When the gas lighting. Gas lighting. They'll make you question everything about your own sanity, oh yeah. When you question, they make you question. If something seems wrong, that's just the way it's supposed to be, oh yeah. It's your problem, not the church's problem. If you point out something's bad, then they'll say you must be mad. They'll attack your real intent while dismissing what you meant. It's gaslighting. Oh, well, it's so gaslighting with the things the prophet Joe would do. No seersome, he didn't use a seersome. But then they change the narrative and tell you that they always knew. He used a seersome, of course he used a seersome. It's always been, or well, he am. It's gaslighting. Howlin said the missionary force would grow as God directed, oh yeah. But when it shrank, they had to say that was exactly as expected, oh yeah. You thought two plus two was four, might not be that anymore. Cause when you start reproving, those goalposts start a moving gaslighting. I am Elder Stephen L. Stickenbottom, and I welcome you to this brand new exhibit at the Church History Museum entitled Transparency Through the Ages. As you may know, our church has always been open and honest about our history, and so we Excuse wanted to- Excuse me? Yes? I know the tour is just beginning, but I already want to bang my head against a wall. Oh, sure. Well, please use the wall to your left. Okay. We seem to get this a lot. You can see the impression of Bill Reel's head over there. Okay, now, moving on. Our first stop is to show you all of the several different accounts of Joseph Smith's first vision. As you can plainly see through the foggy glass display case on the miniature printed copies, there are no important differences between any of these accounts. It looks like this 1832 diary page was torn out and taped back in. Oh no, you must be imagining that. It has normal wear and, um, tear for a document of its age. Now over here we have the Book of Abraham. I heard that has some problems with its translation. I'm afraid you heard wrong. See, it never was a translation. But it says right here, translated from the papyrus. By no, the you see, that's not what translation means in this case. It means that Joseph was inspired by a document that had no connection whatsoever with Abraham to write a book that claims that Abraham himself wrote the book. It's rather obvious, really. Oh, and when Joseph translated the Book of Abraham, he may have used this beautiful seer stone, which we are proud to display here. Wait, didn't Joseph Fielding Smith insist that seer stones were never used? No, you're taking that out of context. You know, you want to be careful about playing whack-a-mole with church history issues. Now, if you'll come this way, you can see a diorama depicting Joseph Smith surrounded by over 30 of his beloved wives. Of course, we understand and accept that he practiced polygamy and polyandry, as expected. Some of his wives look really young. Some were as young as, um, several months shy of 15. But as I'm sure you're aware, several months shy of 15 was in the extreme outlier range for what was the customary age for marriage at the time. We were never taught any of this stuff at church. Well, if you didn't know, then it's your own fault, because many egg-headed church historians and scholars have known about these things for years. You're just not well-read enough, apparently. Hey, you want to go back to that wall again? Yeah, let's go. Ow, 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 it was so gaslighting when the gospel topic essays were done. We used to say this stuff was anti-modern. Now it's so gaslighting when they're redefining translation. When it says translate, it doesn't mean translate. The things they twist, uh -huh. she'll make you piss. Uh -huh. It's gaslighting. There's this idea that the church is hiding something, that, which we would have to say as two apostles who have covered the world and know the history of the church and know the integrity of the first presidency in the corner of the 12 from the beginning of time, there has been no 